Why are summers at the Shalom Hartman Institute so special? Because that's when Jewish leaders and learners, like you and me, travel to Jerusalem to wrestle with big ideas and study with Hartman's inspiring faculty. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. Our scholars draw on 3,000 years of Jewish wisdom to develop the ideas we need to face today's challenges. This summer, the pandemic has prevented us from traveling, but it doesn't prevent us from learning together. Welcome. Join hundreds of Jewish leaders for All Together Now, a month-long celebration of ideas from the Shalom Hartman Institute. From now until July the 23rd, come learn with us in this moment of crisis and opportunity. Hello and welcome to tonight's session, American Judaism Through Israeli Eyes, with Yehuda Kurser and outgoing Consul General in New York, Danny Dayan. My name is Maytel Friedman and I am co-director of the Shalom Hartman Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, and I will be introducing our speakers tonight. The Muslim Leadership Initiative is a program that seeks to transform Muslim Jewish relations in North America by inviting Muslim leaders to study about Jews, Judaism, and Israel with leading Jewish scholars at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Tonight's session is part of All Together Now, Jewish Ideas for This Moment from the Shalom Hartman Institute. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. We are excited to have close to 7,000 people registered for this month-long celebration of ideas. That includes more than 1,100 rabbis, 900 educators, and 700 Jewish community professionals. We are also hosting major learning programs for teens and college students. Now I'm going to share a few announcements before Ambassador Diane and Dr. Kurtzer begin. We encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A feature of this webinar throughout this conversation. Ambassador Diane and Dr. Kurtzer will respond to audience questions during the last 15 minutes. They and I are the only ones who can view your questions. This session will be recorded and should be available within two days on our website. Lastly, at the end of this session, you will be invited to complete a brief survey about your experience. Thank you in advance for taking the time to share your feedback. And now without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our two speakers tonight, Ambassador Danny Dayan and Dr. Yehuda Kurser. Ambassador Danny Dayan is completing his fourth and final year as Israeli Consul Gen General in New York. As Consul General of, New York in, of Israel in New York, he has represented the state of Israel to communities throughout New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Delaware. Born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, he is the first Hispanic Consul General of Israel in New York. Ambassador Dayan has established a reputation as an Israeli public figure, lecturer, and entrepreneur. Dr. Yehuda Kurser is the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He is the co-editor of the newly released book, The New Jewish Canon, a collection of the most significant Jewish ideas and debates of the past two generations. Yehuda is also the host of the Shalom Hartman Institute's podcast, Identity Crisis, a weekly podcast about the ideas behind the news. Their complete bio can be found on the Hartman website. And with that, Dr. Kurser and Ambassador Diane. So, uh, Ambassador Diane, or if I can call you Donnie, if that's Danny, okay. Donnie, Donnie, and you guys. Uh... Yeah, great. I'm really, I'm really honored and thrilled that uh, you're participating with us in this learning program. As you heard and as you saw, we have thousands of Jewish leaders uh, and friends of the Jewish people studying together with us this summer and looking at all the big questions facing the Jewish people and trying to find some meaning and wisdom in these uh, in these tricky times. And uh, I'll say to our listeners, uh, you heard the bio uh, of, of uh, Ambassador Dayan, and I think one of the things that's reflected in there a little bit, and something that everybody who knows you knows, um, that you are a straight shooter, you've always been. Um, you, you say things in ways that are powerful and straight, and, um, and that you have been an, just an unbelievable mensch uh, to the Jewish community in North America, and I know many of us will miss you, even with, or maybe because of, um, 
uh, continuing disagreements, uh, which is part of what the, the story of the Jewish people is about. So if I can, I, I kind of want to start there with you. Um, so with a little bit of a self-referential question, which is in our program this summer uh, with, uh, with our learners, we as an Israeli and as an American institution have managed to convene a conversation that includes folks like you who represent one piece of this political spectrum and with speakers like Mohammed Darausha, who's at a different side of the political spectrum in Israeli society, uh, Chavera Knesset, Knesset member Tammy Zanberg from the Meretz party last night. And, um, and one of the things that we are trying to do is to actually create a conversation among American Jews about Israel that mirrors the broad diversity and complexity of the state of Israel itself, even though oftentimes in the American Jewish community, you, there's a narrower band of acceptable ideas than there is even in the Knesset. So I'm curious what your observations have been about the American Jewish discourse about Israel and your thoughts about what the, how wide the tent should be uh, and what the parameters of that might look like for the Jewish community here. Well, thank you, Yuda, for having me. It's really a privilege and honor. I think that we had this conversation off record some uh, two years ago, probably in your office, and uh, I promise you that as uh, I said when my term ends, but it's really ending in, in 10 days, so it's uh, about time I can uh, speak uh, uh, what I have in mind also on record with your distinguished audience. Um, well, it's a very broad question, obviously, uh, what you just said. Uh, indeed, uh, I think that um, I have a lot of praise for the American Jewish community, and I have a lot of criticism of the American Jewish community. And I can say without reservation to paraphrase, to quote actually uh, the Bible, to quote Proverbs, uh, all the, 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 the wounds inflicted by a friend, by a lover are, are well-intentioned. And uh, even when I have criticism, I do it from a position of real love for the American Jewish community. You know, something very peculiar happened to me in my first weeks here in New York. I uh, felt a very strong feeling, a very, a very strong sensation of deja vu. And it took me time to understand which kind of deja vu is this. I mean, it wasn't deja vu to the Fifth Avenue. No, uh, it wasn't, definitely not. Uh, I have been many times in the Fifth Avenue, but that's not what I felt. Um, so my question to myself was, I, I try to understand why do I feel a sensation? I never lived in New York. Uh, and suddenly, you know, it was an epiphany moment. I, I understood what is that deja vu. And that deja vu is from my childhood and teenage years in Argentina in Buenos Aires. So you can ask what, what's the relation between Buenos Aires and New York are different cities. Yes, but it, for the first time, probably in my more than 50 years in Israel, I, under, I remembered how is it to be a, a Jew outside of Israel. It was the exact sensation that I felt in Buenos Aires as a child, as a teenager, and suddenly felt it here in New York. Even, you know, in the, in the small things like calling the Beit Knesset Shul, or uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah came uh, a few weeks after I arrived here to hear Agut Yonte. Mm -hmm. But not only in the Yiddishism, it was something, something much more deeper, but much more deep than that. And, uh, you know, you asked about the, how wide the tent is. In my entire life, uh, in, in, in my public life, not only public, but we are talking about public life, in all areas I was involved, I always tried to make the tent as wide as possible. Um, and uh, when it relates to American Judaism, the American Jewry, and any actually Jewish community, for me, the most basic tenet, the most basic principle is Jewish solidarity. There is nothing that, is, for me, Jewishness is first and foremost peoplehood. I am a non-observant person. I long ago decided that uh, my relationship with the Almighty, this is one of the things I will analyze after I retire. I'm hoping it will not be too late. Um, that's probably the reason I felt so comfortable 
uh, with a Jewish woman uh, putting tefillin and with the square Rebbe in New Square because uh, I really, the, the liturgic or the, 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 the theological thing never bothered me. Uh, uh, for me, the, you know, I have a definition of who is a Jew. The, the quintessential question, the perennial question of who is a Jew that even topple governments in Israel, I have my own definition. My definition of who is a Jew is a person that every October, November, each year, when the list of Nobel Prizes are, is published, he, looks how, he or she looks how many Jews are in the list. If you do that, you are either anti-Semite or a Jew. <laughs> on the other hand, you look, uh, when an aircraft crashes, you look how many Jewish names are there. Mm -hmm. So for me, Jewishness is about soli Jewish solidarity, Jewish res mutual responsibility, is for me the most important thing in Judaism. It's obviously, I'm simplifying it, but, and therefore, uh, for me, uh, the tent included everybody, except for, I would say, Neture Karatai on one side, because their opposition to this, to, to their hatred to the state of Israel excludes them from a very important part of Jewish solidarity, the solidarity with Israel, and JVP on the other hand. Notice that I didn't say Satma, and I didn't say J Street. Uh, I said Nutuai Kata and JBP because they coalesce with Israel's enemies, with the enemies of the Jewish people in order to, 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 to attack or to erase Israel. Um, and uh, for me, that is the tent. But it's, uh, what I just said is somewhat, uh, I mean, uh, too easy a response. It is too easy, yeah. Because there are things that uh, I see lately in some sectors of the uh, American Jewish community that, but that for me, infringe that uh, solidarity. They hurt that solidarity. Uh, obviously, uh, I think that uh, when a Jew writes an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, uh, dismissing, uh, abandoning the idea of a Jewish state, uh, that that crosses a line of Jewish solidarity to tell me uh, your country can drop dread, can the Jewish state can drop dead, that, yes, that crosses a red line. Okay, uh, if, I, if I interrupt you, and can we probe on that a little bit? And we'll come, sure. back, to, sure. we'll come back to the 10 question, because one of the things that's so interesting about the example that you're, you're describing, which is, I would say not, it's not a single individual. There is a, they're growing, burgeoning uh, section of the American Jewish community that calls into question the fundamental legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state uh, would argue that they are interested in a Jewish homeland. Uh, they're not, they would argue passionately that they don't want to see Jews uh, uh, experience an existential threat, but that they believe that the cause of justice is better pursued by one state between the river and the sea rather than a two-state solution. And what's so tricky is um, in your time prior to becoming Consul General of the State of Israel, you too were an outspoken critic of the two-state solution. I so never was an advocate of a one-state solution. Never. Or if, not even for one minute. Okay, but there I are. Think, uh, I, I never was an advocate of the one. State but there solution. certainly are. The fact that I believe yeah. that the two-state solution is neither uh, uh, um, achievable nor solves the conflict is a completely different thing. A, a one-state solution means the end of the Jewish state, and we never, even for one minute, nor me nor Prime Minister Netanyahu advocate such a thing. But there. Okay. But, but, uh, the interesting thing that what you said about that burge burgeoning, as you, I'm not sure that it's so burgeoning, but uh, let's suppose that it is, is that it disguises itself as a progressive, uh, a, a progressive uh, idea. Actually, it's quite a regressive idea. I mean, this is an idea that was uh, promoted in the 1920s, 100 years ago, abandoned in the 1930s already because of its sheer. Uh, 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 not only not being practical, but also uh, 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 preventing the establishment of the Jewish state. And actually, the only uh, group 
that dragged that uh, idea into the 40s of the previous century is the Soviet-controlled uh, PKP, the Communist Party of Palestine and Israel. Uh, they were the only that, in, even in the 40s, uh, mule that idea. So nothing progressive about that. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, regressivism about that. But the other thing that you just uh, uh, implicated is the, 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 when American Jews translate American English to Hebrew. Not the, I'm not, not, I don't mean the language, I mean the values, the, 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 the precepts, the ideas. Uh, and that, you know, as in every translation, it loses, uh, in, many of, in many cases, it loses the essence of the thing. You cannot uh, translate uh, verbatim uh, ideas that are uh, uh, immersed in the American uh, uh, experience uh, into the Israeli experience and believe that they are applicable. And that, yes, well, that's one of my criticisms of American Jewry sometimes. Right. So, and, and in fact, one of the things that I wrote in response to Peter Beinart's piece in my own response was, there's no, if we're talking about politics, to advance a position that actually has no Israeli electorate, um, or even Arab Israeli citizens of Israel, uh, and the kind of casual dismissal of even Ayman Oda, around whom this is constructed, just makes no sense. But... That's it. Uh, let me add one thing, uh, Yuda. Uh, there was only there was also another uh, thing that was very evident in in the in that article, and look, it may uh, disappoint a lot of our listeners here now when I say that, uh, because it's not only Peter Beinart in that respect. The thought, uh, I would say, the naive thought. Uh, some would say the chutzpah that uh, we Israelis, we Israeli Jews, came to Eretz Israel and fight and give our lives, sometimes risk our lives, and have endured terrorism and a lot of things, only for the sake that American Jews will have a refuge, a shelter, if in 2057 something happens in this country. No, that is a, a collateral benefit of the existence of Israel. But we return to my Zionism, I think that the Zionism of most Israelis is the Zionism of re-establishing Jewish independence in our ancient homeland. As a result of that, Jews all over the world have a shelter. But we don't do it only, I mean, it's not the prime goal, it's a collateral benefit that Jews will have a shelter and our second Holocaust will not happen any, never again. Uh, uh, the, the idea that is enough if we, 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 you, you can, we can be a shelter even if you are not an independent country, only a Jewish home because uh, the gates will be open. No, my, my friend uh, Peter Beinart, we didn't uh, uh, make all those sacrifices in order to, have, to, to potentially give you a shelter on how we are. The moment you will need one, we will open our arms with as broadly as we can. of anybody else. I think there is a growing fear by many American Jews who you would describe based on um, even your categories as well within the discourse of Zionism, committed to a Jewish state, deeply committed to a Jewish state, and a growing... Oops, I lost you, Yuda. Call it... You hear me? Uh, now I do. Okay. Um, a growing fatigue by many American Jews around, who are very much in the camp, around whether there's going to be a two-state solution, and more than that, the responsibility of the state of Israel in, and its commitment to a two-state solution. And a skepticism, and, and it's, no, it's hard to separate that until it didn't happen, there was going to be an annexation. And when there was going to be an annexation, until it didn't happen, it signaled a significant altering of a status quo that many of us feared, uh, combined with all sorts of facts on the ground over the last three decades, uh, make, make it impossible in the long run to actually get towards a two-state solution. So how, does, how, does, how, how do you want, want American Jews who are committed to the same project of Jewish sovereignty self-determination and a Jewish nation state, how do you 
um, what do you want of American Jews uh, in dealing with that fatigue and that frustration, um, especially when we feel or see that the state of Israel is pursuing a course of action that may be contrary to that goal? Okay, I can't answer, you know, the political side of your question. I did it multiple times in the last uh, week or two, but I think it will take too, uh, if you allow me, I think it will take too much of our time uh, and divert it from the Jewish, Israel, Jewish connection side of your yeah. question. So I will not now make the, the case for annexation or the case uh, uh, why two states uh, didn't happen at when what should happen uh, in order to change that, etc., etc. But the question is, how American Jews see the relationship with Israel. And uh, sometimes I think that uh, American Jews see it as that, uh, uh, let's say a that uh, observant Orthodox father or parent that says, look, uh, if you don't uh, Shomer Shabbat, uh, go, I will, throw out, I will throw you out from my home. Um, no, that's not the, the way to see a relation. We have a lot of criticism for, for, for American Jewry, but doesn't mean that you cease to be our brethren and we cease to care about you. So that's perfectly okay to make your point, to explain your point, to, to make it uh, 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 even strongly. But there is no, the, look, we are Jews, but our marriage has to have Catholic rules, meaning no divorce. There, is, there shouldn't be an excuse for divorce. And I, I'm talking about the both sides. A lot of Israelis were annoyed by what we perceived as American Jewish support for the Iran deal that we felt is existential to our, to our physical existence. But that doesn't mean I, I can cut your, my, my ties with you. Otherwise, that's not, Solidarity. If there is no solidarity, we are no. If we, we are not one family, we are not. So, in some sense, I sometimes uh, 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 even uh, compare it to a bigoted father that that throws from home the, the child if he he he, he is uh, homosexual. But let's say an observant Jew that throws out uh, 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 from home his his child because he doesn't uh, shomer Shabbat. That's that, and in that respect, I, I, it's very important for me to say the following. First of all, we have to completely make a distinction between rights and positions. The right, in my view, the right of a Jew to daven in the Kotel in the way he or she wants is an inalienable right. And yes, in this thing, I say, Clearly now, 10 days before I finish my term, but I did say it also in real time, Israel is at fault. Positions is a completely different thing. Positions are debatable, are, and, and positions, especially in positions that affect Israel's security, Israel's way of life, we have to say very clearly, we listen to you. It's one of our considerations. But we, with all due respect, we make our decisions and we expect you to respect that. I mean, we expect to con not to cut the familial ties that unite us as one people. That is my expectation. Probably it's an exaggerated expectation. I expect the same from Israel. Right. So I, I, you know, I think you and I probably agree on some aspects of the conceptual piece, which is... I also am a believer in Jewish peoplehood. For me, this has, uh, uh oh, there's a car alarm going off here. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, what happened? It is what it is. Um, I agree with you conceptually. I believe in Jewish peoplehood. For me, there's more of a religious piece of the story of Jewish peoplehood than it is purely a secular commitment. But I do believe that that commitment transcends where we happen to live. It transcends racial and ethnic diversity. Um, I don't believe you can have peoplehood without pluralism. They're indefinitely in, in interlocked with one another. We have to actually believe in difference at the core. But you parse a distinction, and you and I have argued about this in the past, so I would love to do a version of it publicly if we can. Um, you parse a distinction between the things that Israel has to make room for, for the opinions and views of world Jewry, and the things that it doesn't have to make room for. And here's what frustrates me. My frustrates me is, 
I've confessed in front of the 255 people who are here, I don't care about the Kotel, right? I don't, it's not my thing. I don't like davening at the Kotel. It drives me crazy. I don't, that's not a piece. I, I like it because I'm a historian of ancient Judaism. So I like the archeology, span but it has no appeal to me. And what it feels a little bit like is, let me, I have a whole bunch of issues that, um, that matter to my safety survival, to the essential piece of the project. And I'm telling you that I'm, I'm willing to fight to let you have place um, in the piece of Israel that actually doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter that much to you either, davening at the Kotel. Uh, I mean, personally, I care about the safety and security of the state of Israel, not just because I feel like it implicates my Judaism, and it's not, like, not just because I'm embarrassed by Israeli public policy, but because actually that's what it means to be in relationship to the Jewish people. So when I have passionate uh, views and opinions about safety and security, it's okay. through Jewish peoplehood, right? So how do I square that? No, no, there is no contradiction at all. I said, I, I think, look, I think that the thing I, I hate most is an apathic Jew to Israel, not a, 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 a person that says, you are dead wrong and your policy is going to be catastrophic. And uh, the, the thing that I uh, hate most is a Jew that doesn't care about Israel. So I completely agree with you. I only said that ultimately the decisions on those matters will be made, should be made, uh, by those that decided not to be spectators in the greatest uh, Jewish adventure of the last 2000 years, but to be protagonists. The fact that you decided to become a protagonist and not a, spe a spectator gives you additional rights that as a spectator you don't have. As a spectator, when you see a, 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 a show in Broadway, you don't have the prerogative to improvise and to change the text. Uh, otherwise, you will be thrown out of the theater. Uh, but if you are a, a, an actor, you can do that, and probably you will, you will be booed or applauded. I don't know. If, uh, uh, but it's your prerogative. Uh, you know what is the thing that the most annoying experience I had, I ever had in New York, and it occurred to me not once but many times. The most annoying experience I have in New York, and it happens, uh, unfortunately, eh, not very frequently, but it happens, uh, is when a Jewish person comes to me, a, a gentleman or a lady, and tells me, you know, Mr. Dayan, I love your country. And I said, my country is your country. But suddenly I understand, no, it's not her country. It's not his country. It's my country. I, uh, uh, that drives me crazy when, when, right. when a Jew tells me, I love your country. Of course, if he said, I, I hate your country, it may annoy me most, but more, but uh, uh, even when he says, I love your country, it, it drives me crazy. If I understand, in America, I tell that uh, frequently also to my, to my Israeli uh, uh, audience. Look, uh, unfortunately, American Jews are not Israelis in waiting. But the problem with Donnie with the spectator protagonist metaphor, right, is you're, let's say you're right. You're the protagonist. You're the, you're, the, you're the shapers and creators of this drama. And American Jews are spectators. I don't like that metaphor at all, just for the record. But okay. And part of the reason I don't like that metaphor is because in so many ways, the state of Israel was the project of world Jewry, primarily the people who actually pick up and move there. But there's, it's almost inseparable from, as a project of the Jewish people from the middle of the 20th century. But let's say we stay with the metaphor. The problem is that the protagonists and the spectators, when you're in a theater or when you're on a field of play, have a much more intimate relationship than you're portraying, which is All right. I if, agree. if the fans decide at a certain point not to buy tickets, or if the fans decide to boo, it will have a much more profound psychological, economic, and existential effect on the players in the playing field. So ha and in that respect, that's what I'm worried about, which is this, the, the, when the protagonist says to the spectator, I will let you cheer for that part, but not for this part. And I say, no, no, I'm actually, what I care about is, I, I care about occupation because I care about democracy. Because that's the big story, right? So that's what I want to, that's where the, that's where a really intimate conversation between American Jews and Israeli Jews 
can actually. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, the the, the metaphor uh, of the audience and the the, pro, the and the, the actors is not uh, uh, so totally accurate. Uh, it reflects <laughs> only a part of the of the complex of the complexity of the issue we are talking about. So I have to say about that uh, two things. First of all. Um, Yes, you have, a, I think, a duty to try to influence. Yes, um, I think that uh, you, you have a duty to try to influence if you care. I mean, if, you, if, I, if I see my uh, brother doing something wrong and I care, I should tell him, look, I think you are doing something wrong, even when I understand that it's his decision, even his decision in some ways influences my future or my uh, something. But uh, uh, first of all, in that respect, I would like to say something, a piece of advice to the American jury. Um, uh, and, you know, if you want to influence uh, Israel, um, Israel's policy on what you call occupation or on religious uh, pluralism, uh, my uh, guess is that uh, Publishing a press communique in English in Manhattan is not the proper, is not the most effective way to do it. I have, I have yet to see a press communique in English in Manhattan that influenced one person in Beersheba. Uh, and sometimes I feel, uh, I don't know, I think it's even uh, uh, weird that uh, Jewish organization thinks that by uh, publishing a, a press release in, in English in, in New York, uh, they will influence the way Israeli votes or Israeli makes their decisions. You have to be much more uh, uh, involved uh, uh, in Israel, not only in days in which uh, uh, our important decisions are to be made, but uh, always. I will tell you uh, something. I, I, have been, I have been to innumerable close sessions with American Jewish leaders from all colors and all uh, uh, sorts about uh, how, to, how American Jewish can uh, influence uh, Israel. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, mentions of uh, reverse uh, birthright. I don't believe in a reverse birthright. I think it's completely out of touch with reality. And uh, I always suggest to them there was there were some even uh, Jewish leaders that uh, uh, started to take my advice seriously. A reverse APAC. I think that if you need if American Jewry wants to influence Israelis, uh, you need a constant, permanent, robust presence in Israel, a kind of embassy in Israel, if you like, uh, that basically does uh, a few things. First of all educate the Israelis about American Jewry. I, unfortunately, I say it with great shame. Israelis know very little about American Jewry. Uh, PR, which is a different thing for than, than education. And uh, the third is lobbying. I mean, if the, if the European Union can have a, a lobbying uh, arm in the Knesset, American Jewry also can have an American, uh, a lobbying uh, arm in the Knesset. Uh, and be involved, not only uh, when the big decisions are to be made, but constantly. And uh, it doesn't happen. There is a the representation of this and a representation of that, and, but it's not a, a robust, serious. There is only one problem with that reverse APAC or that embassy. The problem is that in order to do that, the American jury will have to decide what it is, what is the American jury's position. Right. That's why I was laughing. And that right. is very challenging. <laughs> yeah, who, who does that nomination and who recalls the ambassador when they're disappointed is a bit of a problem. You know, Donnie, the other problem though is that there have been, um, there have been over the years uh, ways in which in the Israeli political culture, the voices of American Jewish values have been portrayed as being um, deeply threatening to the Zionist project. So when um, threatening to the Zionist project. So when, for instance, you know, it's like um, it's like a threefold cocktail of reformi, antizioni, um, right? Uh, uh, right. There, there's the, these terms. Reform oftentimes. Um, I'm losing you again. Times is used. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I do. 
when, um, when organizations even like my own uh, it speak, which an Israeli organization speaks in Hebrew, in an Israeli idiom connected to the IDF, when we talk about things like pluralism as a Jewish value, democracy as a Jewish value, it is, it, it's not as though Israelis are, it's just a problem of not having a lobby. There is a larger um, cultural and political disconnect between what we consider to be core to our values, right? Hey, look, uh, if uh, you got the impression that I think that the honors, the, 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 the blame uh, of the problems that exist between Israeli Jews and American Jews uh, lie on this side of the ocean and the American side of the ocean, uh, no, by no, by no means. Uh, uh, I think that Israel has a, have a, Jew, a huge share of responsibility. Uh, I think that... Uh, I say it with great shame. Israelis don't care enough about American Jews that were, that were Jewish, world, Jew, world Jewry. Um, I always tell Israelis, I said it very many times publicly, that if you go to any place, to the, to the main street of Tel Aviv or Yerushalayim, uh, a settlement or a, 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 a kibbutz, uh, in northern Israel or in southern Israel, and you ask a person, a uh, passerby, uh, tell me what are your five or ten most important public issues. Unfortunately, our relation with American Jewry, we, or the world Jewry, are not among them, and that is a problem. I told the newly nominated uh, the Minister for Diaspora Affairs that uh, in her place, I will spend a significant part of my budget on educating Israelis. In Israel, educating Israelis about the diaspora. Yes, no doubt that exists. And uh, look, the, the challenge here is, is tremendous because look, Yuda, we are, we are different. Totally. We are very different. We are very different. Uh, I would say that the central, the base, the most, central Jewish value for the Israeli Jewry, if we can uh, uh, speak on those terms, is uh, Shivat Zion, the return to Zion, the gathering of the exiles, the return to Zion. The most central value for American Jews, I think, is uh, Tikkun Olam. Um, we develop our characteristics in a completely different strategies. We had for the first time in 2000 years to build, to invent a Jewish majority society. American Jews had to blend into an existing, welcoming to a certain extent, uh, but existing society. Those are completely different uh, uh, ways of survival. And also, and I, here I say it with care because, uh, you know, always ethnic things can be misinterpreted. We are all was different from our places of uh, origin. 50% uh, of Israelis are Sephardic or Mizrahim. Uh, 90 to 95% of American Jews are Ashkenazim. And each group comes with different legacies and different traditions and different uh, 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 beliefs and, and, and way of... So yes, we are different, and the, the, the huge challenge is to, in spite of, not to, neg to negate those differences, to understand, to fully understand those differences, and nevertheless feel brotherhood, feel common responsibility. That's the big challenge, and it's not an easy one, unfortunately. No, it's not, and one of the deepest ways that we've seen this challenge in our organization in Israel is that you know we we built we a big part of the work of the Hartman Institute is around Israel engagement in North America, and precisely hinging on this whole question of what's exotic and foreign, and what's shared, and to not pretend that you can, it doesn't help anybody when you pretend that we're the same, but it also doesn't really help people when all you do is create a structure of difference, right? It, how do you interrogate that difference is critical, and we started a couple of years ago in Israel to try to do the same thing for Israelis. What's a curriculum in, Israel, in the Israeli educational system to really understand world Jewry and North America in particular, but the existential challenge in that curriculum was at a, in a very deep way, the continued existence and thriving 
of a diaspora Jewish community that does not make Aliyah runs counter to the way that most Israelis think about Zionism. It shouldn't, it shouldn't exist. So there is a little bit of an essential problem. So the, the challenge educationally was, how do you teach diaspora to Israelis without undermining their Zionism? Because if you undermine their Zionism, there's no way you can stay in business. But I want to ask you a, um, a different question, which is there, there have been efforts at the parliamentary level um, to make the Israel diaspora question litigated through legislation. So on one end, for instance, there have been legislation, there have been um, parliamentarians who have argued that Israel should wean itself off of foreign aid um, from America, because when it's tied, too much tied into foreign aid, it actually damages the relationship, um, not just between American Jews and Israel, but it, it damages the autonomy of Israel's own political decision making. Or even yesterday, my former, or today, my former uh, Hartman colleague, Tehila Friedman, uh, argued in the Knesset that the Israeli government should care about about the um, seen and heard, the concerns that you have about the American Jewish community. Do you see that as more of an agenda in the social sector between Israelis, or do you think it's a governmental agenda, or maybe a little bit of both? I think that uh, uh, what we need to do is to change, uh, uh, to, to start uh, uh, changing perceptions in, in, in to, to work bottom up to work bottom up, to start uh, changing perceptions in the, in the Israeli society, and that will uh, bring the politicians uh, uh, with them. I asked myself, uh, maybe Taylor Friedman, I, I, I sent her a, a text message uh, yesterday, uh, encouraging to continue uh, with that line. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in the, from the 120 Knesset members, I don't think there is one, Tehila is, is very new, she became a Knesset member, I think a week ago, um, that uh, his ticket, his, his main point, his main agenda is, is, is uh, Israeli diaspora relationship, and that's very telling. We have only one uh, uh, um, academic, degree on, on American Jewish studies in Haifa University, uh, uh, sponsored by the Ruderman uh, Foundation. Uh, there is only, as far as I know, only one Israeli newspaper, Makor Rishon, that has a dedicated uh, a correspondent for uh, diaspora affairs. And I think we should change that. The moment we will change the society, uh, I think that uh, uh, politics politicians will follow suit. I saw the other day, you know, today we, is the old site of Zev Jabotinsky, the great Zionist leader uh, that passed away exactly 80 years ago in, in New York State, actually, in Hunter, New York. And um, I saw not long ago uh, an election poster by Tmuata Herut, by the Menachem Begin's party back in the 50s. And there were three slogans in that poster. Um, uh, the first was, is very politically incorrect these days. It was the Jordan is not the limit of, uh, of our land, meaning also is the East, uh, the East River, the East Bank. Uh, the second was uh, the walls of Yerushalayim are not the limits of our capital. But the third one was interesting. The third one was the sea is not the limit of our people. And um, Today, unfortunately, I don't see a political party uh, making that as one of the three more basic uh, precepts of its uh, platform. Uh, we have a long uh, way to do uh, regarding that. Yeah, I mean, I think the closest we saw was when you had um, Elazar Stern and Ruth Calderon and, um, and several other Knesset members as part of the short-lived Yeshatid revolution for whom diaspora Jewry, world Jewry, and its interests were critical variables in their own platform. And um, it's kind of a fascinating story of how that becomes short-lived. And then suddenly Israel's, the American Jewry's great representatives in the Knesset are no longer there. I was struck by something you said at the beginning of our conversation, Donnie, which I would love for you to unpack, which was um, the sense of familiarity that you had um, from your youth in Buenos Aires. And I, I guess, 
what's striking to me about it is I, I tend to think of America as kind of operating on a very different paradigm than most diaspora Jewish communities because American Jews act more like Israelis in that we see ourselves as at home. Uh, and most diaspora Jewish communities have really seen themselves as diaspora. So I guess, what are the things about the American Jewish experience that surprised you? What are the things that you saw or learned that would not ha you would not have predicted uh, having um, come, you know, come into this role? Well, I must defend Argentina. Uh, we saw uh, American, Argentinian Jews, at least at that time, look, I left Argentina many, many years ago. At least at that time, self, saw themselves very comfortable in Argentina. And I don't think that they felt differently uh, uh, from uh, American Jews in that respect. Uh, uh, but okay, that's... Uh, uh, yeah, that is amazing. So what was surprising, at least, that you, that you uh, learned about America? You know, my father always taught me something that for me was a will, was a legacy. He said, uh, my father, my dad was, my late dad was born in Ukraine. And he arrived to Argentina when he was seven. And he told me, we left Europe with a curse in our lips because we were persecuted and oppressed. We left uh, Argentina for Latin America for Israel with a blessing in our life said because we were treated very very well in Argentina we we, we made Aliyah because of Zionism. Uh, now uh, look uh, you know uh, I, I fully understand uh, what you say but uh, um, for me there is only one great Jewish adventure in the 20, in, 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 in our times and that is the creation of the state of Israel. Uh, and uh, the development of the state of Israel, with all due respect uh, to American Jewry, that I understand perfectly what you said. Uh, uh, and I, I, I said previously about the, the, the American Jew telling me, I love your country and uh, uh, why it, it annoys me so much. Uh, I am a staunch Zionist. I, uh, uh, I many times say uh, Zionism is my religion. Uh, I am an ultra-Orthodox Zionist, but I am also a realist. I am also a realist that I said understand perfectly that the millions of American Jews are not Israelis in waiting, but are Americans. And uh, that's the reason that in spite of being, uh, I say, an ultra-Orthodox uh, Haredi Zionist, um, when I ask myself frequently what if, if in our Jewish generation we have an extra mitzvah that is peculiar uh, to our time, to our generation, uh, there was a generation that the extra mitzvah in Eretz Israel and the United, in America was to save, uh, to rescue the European Jewry from extermination. They failed, as we know, probably they couldn't succeed. I'm not judging. Then there was a generation that had the extra mitzvah to liberate Soviet Jewry, to bring to Israel the Ethiopian Jewry. Thank God they succeeded. What about us? Do we have a special mitzvah uh, in our times, in our, in our contemporary Jewish generations? Uh, for sure not BDS. I mean, BDS is, is almost insulting to put BDS in the same level. As, so it's not so clear. I believe that we have to. And I say again, as, as a Zionist, but as a realist Zionist, the one, one is uh, um, to uh, guarantee the existence, but not just the existence, the, the existence of a robust, secure, thriving uh, nation of, of Medinat Israel, of the state of Israel. And the second is to guarantee the continuity of Jewish life elsewhere. And the tragedy for me will be if uh, each one of the two large Jewish community chooses to see itself as responsible for only one of them. Israelis choose themselves to choose to be responsible for Israel. American Jews choose to be responsible for the continuity of Jewish life here. And we don't have cross responsibility. For me, that will be a tragedy because that may mean that in the Jewish history book that will be written, let's say 100 years from now in 2120 by Hartman Institute, uh, we will read that uh, the Jewish nation split, the Jewish people split to two unrelated tribes during the 21st century. And for me, there is nothing more painful than that. You know, I, I, I ask myself sometimes 
in introspect, how come, I, I said that earlier, how come that I feel comfortable in a reform shul and in an ultra Hasidic shul? And uh, my answer to myself is that I feel not only comfortable, I feel happy to be because I think, I believe that both contribute to the fact that the next, the children that are there will be Jewish in the, uh, and their children also will be Jewish. Everything that contributes to uh, Jewish continuity makes me happy. Everything that uh, uh, impedes Jewish continuity bothers me a lot. For me, that, it, it's Medinat Israel for sure, but Jewish continuity, look, is, uh, I said, I'm not a, a, a person that sees the life on, on, on theological grounds, but for me, the, this incredible chain that started uh, 4,000 years ago, uh, whether it is with Abraham and Sarah or, 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 or whatever, but continued in spite of all the tribulations, all the hardships, and for me, that's, that's our mission in life. My mission in life is to make sure that that chain is not broken and the miraculous, the other miraculous thing that happened in 1948, the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty in Eretz Israel, those two things are kept. There is nothing more important in, for me in life than those two things. And obviously, since it's so important for me, I project that on every Jew, and I think that, that those two should be the missions of every, of every Jew. One of the questions that came in in the chat, I have a couple here. One of them was about um, uh, one of our participants expressed some surprise that you kind of casually dismissed BDS. I'm sure that's not because you don't take it seriously, but I think what was surprising to the questioner and surprising to me too is that actually there's a very loud voice um, from the Israeli government that views BDS as, an, as a major threat. There's government resources that get devoted to this. I have my own skepticism of how much, how much um, oxygen we've given to BDS and our attention to it. And I'm curious whether there's something to that dismissal or whether you do see BDS as a, as a major no, I uh, really don't give too much importance. I, I, will, I, I will ask more seriously in a minute, but I know, uh, uh, the uh, advertising agencies say that uh, sex sells. I think that BDS sells. So it sells contributions to Jewish organizations and budgets to, to Israeli organizations too, etc., etc. But look, uh, the economic boycott of Israel has been a huge failure. Israel is a booming economy, at least it was until the corona hit that had nothing to do with BDS. I mean, if Israel economy boomed in spite of the BDS. So by definition, BDS is a failure. The, the, the uh, cultural BDS, uh, look, uh, you come to Israel and you see, I mean, whatever uh, gig you like, you will find it in Tel Aviv in a normal year, obviously not in, 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 uh, in a corona year. I sometimes, so we have this Nordnik Roger Waters, we can live without Roger Waters. Um, uh, that is the boycott of Israel. I don't underestimate the delegitimization of Israel. But the actual boycott is insignificant. The delegitimization of Israel in campus for, is, is worrying. I must admit that I became worried, more worried about it in the recent weeks or months, because I thought that it is a, a campus thing. And the guys, the, 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 the students will get out from campus to the real world and to Wall Street and to this and to that and will forget about it. What uh, for me was a red light about it was the things that happened in the New York Times uh, lately. Uh, the, cons, the, the, the things that happened to Barry Weiss, but also the dismissal of my friend uh, James Bennett as opinion editor because he published uh, an op-ed by Cotton that I can agree or not, that's not the point. It means that the toxic culture uh, uh, from the campus is now out there and influencing uh, uh, the American society, including, but not exclusively, uh, uh, Israel. One of the things that you, uh, 
uh, pushed back on in terms of American Jewish leaders. Again, I'm picking up on a question about partisanship, but I want to ask it slightly differently, which is you pushed back against American Jewish leaders who came out against the embassy relocation um, uh, in very pronounced ways. And your argument, which I found, I found uh, compelling, even though, again, I didn't totally agree with the outcome, but I found the argument compelling, is you said American Jews cannot become a political party in Israel. Because once they're a political party, then I, as the representative of the state of Israel, am now engaging not with a constituency, but with a political party. However, the flip side is, I think many American Jews are, um, have experienced that the government of Israel's um, involvement in American policy has, um, has taken on a partisan quality to it. So how do we simultaneously has the American Jewish community simultaneously not become partisan on Israel? And how does the state of Israel not feed into American okay. part of it? I'm not sure the two questions are, are, are linked, uh, uh, but those are legitimate questions. Uh, first of all, I said uh, what you just uh, quoted about American Jews becoming a, uh, representing a political party. I didn't say it about American Jews. I did say it about a certain organization. I will say very candidly, it's well known about the URJ, the United Reform Judaism. And I told my good friend, uh, uh, Rick Jacobs, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, self-destructive to blend a, a, a religious denomination with the political positions because he loses allies. Uh, a person like me, I will be completely uh, candid, that is an ally for the reform movement on re issues of religious pluralism and its status in, in Israel uh, find it problematic to help an organization that promotes political positions that I oppose vehemently. Uh, so I think it well, is, is wrong in that, in that sense. Uh, uh, not uh, a, a, every American Jew is entitled to his partisanship. Uh, that being said, what annoys me really is something different. I many times see strong supporters of Israel among American Jews, uh, let's say a Democrat, a Democratic strong supporter of Israel. And I feel that the thing that he or she despises most is a Republican supporter of Israel and vice versa. Strong supporter of Israel in the Republican party that would annex uh, Saudi Arabia to Israel but they despise a Democrat that is supportive of Israel because it, it, it hurts the, the, the argument that says only my party is uh, supportive of Israel. And that I find it uh, sad. I find sad that uh, partisanship on, on, on friends of Israel, on support of Israel, partisanship overrides the... the uh, uh, regarding Israeli, uh, uh, look, uh, um, there are those that think that Israel intervened in the partisan uh, 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 arena in Israel. I, as, as a still a diplomat, will not comment on that. I will only say this. Um, I am a real believer. I don't pay lip service. I am a real believer in the need of Israel to be bipartisan in American politics. Now, it's challenging. It's objectively challenging. Because nothing anymore is bipartisan in this country. Abortion is partisan, gun control is partisan, Black Lives Matter is partisan, uh, uh, you name it, and it's partisan. The weather became partisan. There is one party that believes in, in global warming, the other doesn't. If you think that it's too hot for you in, in CNN, switch to Fox because they don't believe in global warming, the Republicans, so it will be maybe cooler there. Um, and uh, even now, uh, wearing a mask or, or a certain cure for for, for COVID is, is a partisan issue. So under those circumstances to, to keep Israel bipartisan is objectively challenging. Nevertheless, we have to do it. You know, I have a very nice experience now in the, in the primaries in, 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 in the congressional primaries in, in New York. Uh, there was a district in South Bronx. Um, it was a district that was vacated by Jose Serrano, so there is no incumbent, and a lot of Democrats uh, run for that uh, seat. And to my pleasant surprise, I, I, I found out that uh, 
at least five of the six uh, uh, um, front runners uh, were individuals with which I uh, developed a very, very strong relationship. And they were, uh, I think that they, that influenced their positions regarding Israel. Ultimately, Richie Torres uh, uh, is the one that uh, 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 prevailed and for sure he's a staunch progressive support of the state of Israel. I see that as, uh, as extremely important for the state of Israel, uh, 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 that, uh, that thing. So yes, I believe in, 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 uh, in the need of Israel to be bipartisan. I understand that it is uh, it not easy. You know, the fact that uh, we have so intimate relations with the current Republican administration should be viewed in the, in the, in the prism of the, the Israeli strategy to be as intimate as possible with any administration. But of course, it needs two to tango. If a president, uh, uh, one president comes to the Middle East, speaks in the Cairo University and doesn't visit Israel, that means that he doesn't, he wants to keep at, at arm's length on certain issues. And when the other president comes uh, in his first overseas issue visit to Israel, that also means something. So it's not so much about Israel. In general, Yud, I will tell you this to, to wrap this up. The positions of Americans, including American Jews, regarding Israel are much more influenced that you, the American Jews want to, uh, to, to, to admit by internal socio-political currents in America than what Israel does or fails to do, including the occupation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so sometimes to say, yeah, but the occupation of, yes, but religious pluralism is a way to deny the fact that uh, you are being take, you are taken with a strong current that is exclusively American. Yeah. Well, look, I, um, I think it's for sure the case as a resident of the Bronx, it was really interesting to see um, that the national story, quote unquote, about pro-Israel was the Engel Bauman race. And there was a widespread ignoring of the other elections that took place. As, because I think that there are, there's a voice in the Jewish community that's very invested in polarizing the Democratic Party around Israel. I think it's a weird conspiracy of the Republican Party and the far left of the Democratic Party to tell the same, same story, but it doesn't seem to have um, that much traction in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. We have a lot more to talk about. You're very gracious with your time and I'm really grateful to, to be talking to you. There's a lot of things I wanted to keep picking up on, but I'm hoping that we'll have more opportunities. I'll just say, Donnie, um, you it's know, only a, seven hours time difference, Israel, to New York, we can do it's it. It's a short flight when we get back to that. I'll just say, as a child of a diplomat, I have a special love for diplomats, um, and I particularly love diplomats who can both um, know what they can and can't talk about and manage that publicly, and still can um, speak with sincerity and with conviction about the things that they're passionate about. And you've modeled that for us tonight. Um, and, in, and in your whole tenure. And on behalf of the Institute, um, express my gratitude to you and wishing you safe travels um, and whatever, and, and success in whatever comes next. And then hopefully we'll continue to learn, argue, and debate together about the future of the Jewish people. Thank you, Yuda. And since you mentioned it, give my best regard to your dad, which Absolutely. is a, a, a dear friend of mine, in spite of our differences of opinion in many issues. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thanks to our participants. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rato. Bye, Rato.